Starhopper landing close call and more testing incoming, Starship presentation very soon and Starship construction updates, CRS-18 summary and Hayabusa 2, a traveler between worlds. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. There is so much to talk about after Starhopper's successful 20 meter test flight and the CRS-18 mission launch, so let's dive right in. Starhopper almost didn't land on the pad. Last Thursday night it finally happened. Starhopper had its maiden flight demonstrating that SpaceX's new Raptor engine can indeed lift Starhopper into the air. In my last episode, the summary of this maiden flight, I mentioned that Starhopper did not hit the spot on landing that it took off from. When Starhopper lifted off and traveled to the side, it was a first attempt of controlling a flight path. This way SpaceX gets to know the characteristics of the hopper itself. How much thrust do I have to apply to make the hopper move to where I want it to move? Unnoticed by most, Starhopper barely made it back to the pad. As you can see in the picture, Starhopper landed about 5 feet away from the pad's edge where a steep slope is located. If the hopper would have traveled further, there might have been a chance of it tipping over while landing and that would have been a whole different news. Lucky for SpaceX and for us, everything worked out fine though. And Starhopper was already transported back to its original position, no doubt, to get everything ready for another test flight. In fact, today, on July 29th, would be another possible test window, as SpaceX has the opportunity to close roads again today from 2 to 8 pm local time. Next up, Starship progress in Boca Chica and Coco. First, let's look at Boca Chica, Texas, where SpaceX is not only doing first test flights with their Starhopper, but where they're also building one of the two orbital prototypes to in the end go much higher than with the Starhopper. As you can see in this beautiful picture by Eddie Sanchez, the Boca Chica Starship hasn't seen that much ring stacking lately. The reason could simply be that it's reached its height already and that the bottom section with the legs and the internals are the only things missing now. It's only speculation right now, but my guess is that SpaceX is building that bottom section off-site. It's a more complex part and SpaceX might need a clean and dry environment to assemble it. Another interesting picture, in this case by Boca Chica Gal, shows a very strange welding pattern on the outer hull of the Starship prototype in Boca Chica. It is very symmetric and follows a very specific pattern. If anybody out there knows what that is, please feel free to tell us in the comments. The wind barrier structure is pretty much done. The latest addition, being the roof, has been finished in the past few days and now only the covering is missing. Now let's just have a quick look at the Coco construction site. As you can see, the structure is coming along very quickly. The roof is up and they are already building a hangar entrance. A local guard recently, when asked about the structure, said that it is a storm shelter. SpaceX will use it to protect the different Starship stacks from incoming hurricanes and SpaceX should better hurry. For Boca Chica, there already was one hurricane that luckily hit the coast at a different site, but it is only a matter of time before a hurricane hits one of the two construction sites. And if there is no proper shelter up by the time, it could be a major PR disaster and a huge setback for SpaceX. Besides that, the Coco Starship's hull seems to be finished except for the bottom section, same as in Boca Chica. The other ring sections that you can see in the picture laying around here and there are either discarded or test rings that have been around for a long time. So as it seems, all that's left to do is build a bottom section with legs and the internals and assemble it. Elon's recent tweet that the Starship presentation will be within the next two weeks seems to underline the fact that SpaceX is pretty confident in letting us know the latest design changes about Starship and Super Heavy. CRS-18 launch summary now here comes the next big news from SpaceX. On Thursday, July 25th, SpaceX managed to launch CRS-18 to the ISS despite bad weather forecasts. Delayed from July 24th, not many actually believed that the weather would clear up enough to get the Cargo Dragon capsule off the pad, especially because it was an instantaneous launch window, meaning the rocket had to lift off at the exact second, not earlier or later, to make it to the ISS. Despite all that, CRS-18 took off and had a flawless launch, sending the commercial resupply service into round 18. As always, Falcon 9 did a wonderful job. Launching from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, the Falcon carried the Dragon capsule C-108 into orbit for the third time. Previously flown into space in 2015 and 2017, C-108 is a regular visitor to the ISS. 
and Booster 1056.2 was the first flight proven booster to be used on a CRS mission, signaling NASA's confidence in the Block 5 boosters. Naturally, the booster did a perfect landing back at LZ-1. It's crazy how we're used to seeing this now. The primary payload for this mission was IDA-3. It's the second international docking adapter to be installed on ISS. But what about it? Why is it number 3 if it's actually number 2? And I would reply, rocket explosion clip. IDA-1 was lost during the launch failure of CRS-7 and never made it into space. Subsequent investigation traced the accident to the failure of a strut which secured a high-pressure helium bottle inside the second stage liquid oxygen tank. With the helium pressurization system integrity breached, excess helium quickly flooded the liquid oxygen tank, causing it to overpressurize and burst. Hence the white vapor you could see before the IUD. The Dragon capsule actually survived and could have been recovered if the parachutes would have deployed. The software though didn't have any action script in for such an event. It most likely broke apart when it hit the sea. So that's why IDA-3 is the second international docking adapter to be installed on the ISS. It was mainly built from spare parts to accelerate the building process. IDA-3 is planned to be installed at Node 2's Zenith PMA or Pressurized Mating Adapter, also called PMA-3. Other than that, CRS-18 will carry resupplies and science projects. New food for the scientists, pun intended. One item on the list in particular is very unusual. It says one bag of slime, and it's not a joke. Six of these bags were shot into space. Nickelodeon's iconic green slime, best known for being poured onto the heads of game show contestants on the television series Slime Time Live in the early 2000s, was launched into space on board a cargo dragon. The television network is not planning to revive the old series in space though. Rather than dumping buckets full of slime onto the astronauts and creating a huge mess that could be extremely difficult to clean up in microgravity, Nickelodeon is sending its slime into space for science. The science investigation, titled Non-Newtonian Fluids in Microgravity, will examine the physical properties of slime in microgravity through a series of fun experiments. As an interesting side note, on this launch SpaceX tested an insulation around the second stage for the first time. It is supposed to help keep the RP-1 in the upper stage warm. This is needed for long coast missions, where they sometimes ignite the engine after 6 plus hours of coasting again. At that point the LOX has to be chilled and the RP-1 has to be warmed up for a good reignition. So the grey insulation is a test to see if it helps in the process. If it does, we will most likely see this become a permanent addition to the Falcon upper stage. Dragon has arrived at the station by now and was safely berthed with the cannon arm. Now the crew on board ISS is unloading all the cargo. Dragon is scheduled to remain attached to the ISS for about a month, NASA officials said. It will then return to Earth for a Pacific Ocean splashdown bearing a variety of science samples for researchers to study. Good job SpaceX and NASA! Hayabusa 2 Asteroid Sample Collection On the other side of the planet, Japan-based JAXA has been working hard to get a very special package delivered to Earth. Hayabusa 2 a deep space probe built by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, has a very difficult mission it is performing flawlessly right now. On December 3rd of 2014, a Japanese H-2A rocket propelled something very special into interplanetary space. Hayabusa stands for Peregrine Falcon, and as its terrestrial name giver, it travels far away and eventually returns home. After its long journey through the void, Hayabusa 2 arrived at its destination in June 2018, a position 20 kilometers above the surface of an asteroid named Ryugu, which means Dragon Palace. Arrived at the asteroid, it performed multiple tasks. It immediately started scanning the surface, making a precise map and giving us an incredibly clear view of an asteroid otherwise out of reach. It also had four rovers on board, including one built by Germany, called Maskat, and sent them down to its surface to make ground-based measurements with spectrometers, thermometers and cameras. These rovers don't have wheels like the Mars rovers that come to mind. Instead they are little boxes or cone-shaped cylinders and move around by short hops due to the minimal gravity of the asteroid, which would make wheels useless. It also shot an impactor into its surface to measure density and dislocate regoliths for sample pickup. Though when the rovers sent back pictures from the surface, it showed a very different surface compared to what scientists expected to find. 
The surface was made up of large and small boulders with little regolith to collect. Scientists carefully assessed the situation and decided to go for it on February 22nd and again on July 11th. Both sample pickups involved the probe actually touching the asteroid and both times it worked great. The probe collected two full loads of samples. Now the probe is preparing the one thing that makes Hayabusa very very special. It is filling a return capsule with these samples. Once the capsule is filled, sealed and prepared, Hayabusa 2 will carry it back to Earth in December this year and arrive in late 2020. The return capsule will then be released and deorbited so it can be picked up on the ground for analysis. This will mark the second time an asteroid sample will have been returned to Earth as Hayabusa 1 did the same thing in June 2010. With the big difference that Hayabusa 1 faced loads of technical difficulties and in the end was only able to carry a few particles back to Earth, whereas Hayabusa 2 seems to be very successful. Exciting news for Japan. Hopefully the return trip goes as planned and the capsule can land safely. Go JAXA, go Hayabusa 2. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It. Will we finally see the Starship presentation and will Hayabusa 2 return to Earth safely? As always, tell me in the comments. The end of the episode is always reserved for my patrons and we have a few names we can add to the credits. If you want to join the conversation on our Discord server, consider supporting the cause. Link your Discord account with your Patreon account on the Patreon website and then join our What About It Discord server and chat with me and others about your favorite topic. Thank you for watching this episode of What About It. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe and like as this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content as this gives me the time to focus on what I love doing the most. To bring you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. First, let's look at Boca Chica, Texas, where Stash, no, photographer, is pretty confident. <sighs> now here comes the next take. We're gonna do it again. Slime in microgravity. <laughs> Slime in microgravity. Yeah. <clears throat> at the end of the episode, I normally can't speak anymore.